Thank you. Thanks for getting up this morning. Um, yeah, I'm very excited to be here. I love Amsterdam. And uh, I don't know if PPK wants me to tell this story, but I asked him if I could come and speak at Mobilism. And he said, well, have you ever really done any mobile development? And, you know, I haven't done real development since about 2004. I mean, I write a lot of code, but it's not for, you know, that was the last time I worked on my Yahoo. And I said, well, no, you know, I actually haven't done any real production mobile development, but I'm playing with a lot of stuff, and I know I'm going to find a lot of information. And he said, um, well, you know, the slate's kind of full right now. And I said, well, I just want you to know I'm dedicating myself to generating so much information and value around mobile that you're going to regret not inviting me to mobilism. And um, a couple of months later, so I, I actually did that. I worked really hard over the holiday break and got some things done. And um, I don't know if that had an effect, but he very kindly contacted me a couple of months later and invited me. So I'm very excited to be here. Um, I usually like having some funny anecdote to kick things off, and I don't have one right now because it's too early in the morning, but luckily this picture saved me. About a month ago, I did a talk up in San Francisco, and it was the, the day before the talk, I was searching through Flickr, looking for a good photo about mobile and how fast or slow it was. Either way, it would work. And I couldn't find, I spent like two hours, and I couldn't find anything. And I was coming home that morning, um, and I crossed the, gate and there's all these snails there and I thought oh this is it this is perfect so I grab a snail and I go inside and I put it on the phone and I think this is a real uh, testimony to the fidelity of these devices the snail was able to kick my iPhone into edit mode if you notice you know, all of the icons are editable. And he actually climbed diagonally across and he hit the X on Twitter and he deleted my Twitter app. <laughs> and it's even funnier. It was perfect because this was the day that the dick bar got released and everyone was really pissed off about the dick bar. So I got to get up at Web2 Expo and say the snail doesn't like the dick bar either. So. Uh, <laughs> So it's a good picture. It's not Stephanie and Luke had great photos yesterday. So my foot, it's a little grainy, but um, it's a good story. Uh, oh, I just wanted to mention these slides are on my website, stevesouders.com. So if you go there, you can download them right now. OK, so let's get started. Uh, one of the things I'm known for are these two books with these lists of rules. Um, and I started collecting these back in 2004. Um, and, uh, you know, they've, we've seen, you know, greater adoption of these rules. I've talked to a lot of people here, and I was in Italy before here, and people have come up and talked about how they've deployed these on their site. So these rules, these best practices, and not just these, other people have generated um, similar best practices, are, you know, getting pretty uh, widely adopted. But back when I started this in 2004, I kind of felt like a lone voice in the woods. Um, I was working at Yahoo at the time, and I would go and talk to teams about the importance of making their websites faster from various perspectives, code quality, uh, certainly user experience, and um, a lot of times this dialogue would fall on deaf ears. People weren't necessarily interested in doing this, and often what it was was developers, I think, are, are kind of have something built into their DNA to write optimized code. They're really proud of their stuff being frickin' fast, right? And, and a lot of times, though, the decision-making about where resources are going to be spent is not in the hands of the developer. So that was back in 2004. Fast forward to uh, future of web apps, and we have Fred Wilson, the number one VC out of New York City, giving a talk at a tech conference on his 10 golden principles of successful web apps. Guess what the number one principle is? Speed. Fred says, First and foremost, we believe that speed is more than a feature. Speed is the most important feature. And he talks about how all their portfolio companies are monitored by Pingdom. And uh, in their uh, portfolio, there's uh, direct empirical data that when the company's website performance drops off, their business drops off. So for him, it's the number one principle for successful web apps. So 
um, how did we get to this point where uh, six years later we have a VC getting up at a tech conference talking about website speed and how important that is? I think a big part of it is about two years ago I realized that the decision makers in a lot of these organizations were salespeople, marketing people, product people, uh, executive management, and that we needed to talk in a language that they would understand. So I started um, curating, collecting a set of case studies about the value of importance beyond just code quality. So uh, I got at, on Velocity two year, at Velocity two years ago. I got uh, Google Search and Bing to get up on stage together and co-present. It turned out that they had both told me on the side that they had run basically the exact same experiment, where they injected a delay on the server side for search and measured the impact of that on user behavior. And so uh, Bing took it up to two seconds and they saw all their good metrics drop off, maybe most significantly a 4% drop off in revenue per user. Google search uh, ran the same experiment. They took it up to 400 milliseconds and they only saw a 0.6% drop off in searches, uh, searches per user, which you know, is basically revenue. Um, so, you know, that's not a big percentage, but at Google scale, it's a lot of money. And Luke actually referenced this uh, stat yesterday. The scarier thing about this stat was they had, you know, a control bucket uh, test group and this test group that they injected this latency to, and they removed the latency, and that test group did not recover to their pre-test levels of searches for three months. So this... Um, reaction, the user reaction to a slow website is something that's learned and ingrained. And so it's really important to uh, work on that, you know, for your website success, for your brand recognition. It's also important to keep this in mind because if you do something like slow the site down or speed the site up and measure it the next day, you might not see the change in user metrics right away, the change in behavior. It might take weeks or even months for that change to take effect. But it is something that our users learn and react to. Yahoo uh, later ran a similar experiment. Uh, they injected a 400 millisecond delay and saw a five to nine drop off in full page traffic. This came out from Mozilla, uh, the landing page for IE. If you are in IE and you land on a page to download Firefox, they made that page 2.2 seconds faster and saw a 15% increase in downloads. This is 16 million uh, more downloads a year for them, so very significant. This was one of the best case studies from Shopzilla two years ago where they did a significant speed up. They went from seven seconds to three seconds and they saw their uh, revenue go up seven to 12%. Uh, this is very significant in Google AdWords um, there's a quality score and the uh, speed of your site is one of the factors in that AdWords quality score. So by making their site faster, their quality, AdWords quality score went up and they uh, went up in uh, ad ranking and they uh, saw the number of unique sessions from search engine marketing, basically AdWords, more than double. And this was one of the first case studies where we saw people talking about not only improving user metrics and revenue metrics, but reducing operating costs. So for the same number of users, same, number of, same amount of functionality, the number of servers needed to uh, run the website dropped in half. And that makes sense, right? If you're deploying these best practices like adding caching headers, then there's much fewer requests that have to go to the server, so the server has less work to do. Or if you minify, obfuscate, compress your responses, they're smaller, so it's easier for the server to get those off the box and be freed up to do more, more work. So we see that it dropped um, uh, hardware costs. This is Bill Scott at Netflix, the first time he was at Netflix uh, two years ago. For some reason, they didn't have gzipping turned on for HTML, so they turned it on and the outbound traffic from their data center got cut in half. So if anyone pays the uh, network bill for your data center for a site like Netflix, this is uh, definitely in the high six figures a year that they're saving from that. And this was Edmunds.com, Ishmael, talking about how they did just, <coughs> excuse me, one simple change where they added expires headers and removed e tags, and it cut their CDN traffic by a third. So again, if you can imagine reducing your CDN bill by a third, that's a significant amount of money. Um, and then 
Last year, we saw Google announce that SiteSpeed, in addition to being part of Google AdWords Quality Score, was now going to be taken into consideration for search ranking. And search ranking, SEO, is definitely a big business. Um, so this uh, caught a lot of people's attention and, again, raised the awareness of working on website performance. So I saw all of this coming to a head, and about a year ago, um, I started whispering to Tim O'Reilly that I saw a new industry emerging, and I called it WPO web performance optimization. And there's basically four benefits that you get with WPO um, that are upheld by these case studies. It drives traffic to your site, like we saw for uh, Shopzilla. It changes the uh, user behavior. It improves the user metric. Uh, it's really interesting. In these case studies, a lot of times people track um, session length and page views per session. You would think if pages are being served faster, users would get off the site faster, and it's just the opposite. They are more engaged, they're having a better experience, and session length actually usually increases as you make the website faster. Um, so it improves the user experience, increases revenue, reduces operating costs. So it's a, a good movement and I think we've got a lot of uh, growth uh, that we're looking for in here. Already there are about 20 startups um, in this WPO space. Optimize, Torbit, Zoom, Strange Loop Networks coming out. Okay, so um, more revenue, lower cost, better user experience, more traffic. Um, does anyone want those things? for your website, yeah, it's all goodness, right? So we all agree faster websites is good. Okay, so we're done with that sales part, part two. Uh, so uh, a, a few months ago I announced this change in focus to work on mobile, and uh, there are several things that got me excited about changing my focus to mobile, but the thing that really kicked it off were these slides from Mary Meeker at um, Web 2.0 Summit. The last two years, she's done great slide decks there that touched on mobile. So this is one that just talks about the uh, explosive growth that we're seeing in mobile. It's kind of hard to read, but basically what she's doing is she's plotting the adoption of desktop internet through Netscape uh, versus mobile, and we can see that over the same time period, 11 quarters, mobile is you know four times bigger than uh, desktop was. So no surprise there. Everyone here, we're at a mobile conference, so you know we all know that mobile is exploding and it's taking off. And then she showed this slide. So Rakuten uh, is a company in Japan, a website in Japan, kind of like Amazon. They sell everything. They even sell groceries. And you can see the yellow part. Uh, so the, the columns are their e-commerce revenue. And you can see the yellow part is their mobile e-commerce. And you can see how that's grown and grown and grown over the years. So she did this talk in 2010. So the stats just were up until 2009. So we see in 2009 that went up to 18%. For this same time period, that mobile e-commerce revenue for Amazon was 2%. So we know that the US lags behind uh, Asia and other countries in the adoption of mobile. And so I believe what this uh, story tells, what this slide tells, is there's an order of magnitude growth for uh, companies, at least in the US, to increase their mobile e-commerce. And uh, that was supported by this article that just came out last month um, where they talked about a study Comscore and Gomez had done where they're talking about, you know, 1.1 billion over phones. Well, that's a lot of money, but it's really only 2%, 2.6% of total e-commerce. So there's a lot of room for growth there. And I believe that the companies that are going to get that order of magnitude growth in mobile e-commerce are companies, websites that have um, fast performance. And luckily, uh, Mary's next slide actually confirmed that. So she puts up a lot of data, but then she puts up these things which are her hypotheses. And she says that um, people on mobile are going to expect near zero latency access to nearly all information. I love that. So Mary Meeker is touting fast performance. So there's a lot of opportunity here uh, to work on mobile performance and to see a lot of adoption. Another thing that got me excited about it is, whereas in 2004 I was kind of a lone voice in the woods, um, and I had to convince even big companies, including Yahoo, to really focus and dedicate resources on making websites faster. We're already seeing that in the mobile space, speed is something that's being touted as a competitive differentiator. So here we see iPhone, second word in the ad, fastest, Nexus S, 
Fast just got faster. Just to be clear, it was fast before. It wasn't slow, but it's getting faster now. So it's fast and it's getting faster. We have AT&T, which again, it was already fast, but now it's getting four times faster than the speedy speed that it has before. And uh, Verizon, blazingly fast speeds. So we're already seeing these companies, uh, talk, these big players in the mobile space, talking about the importance of speed and trying to sell that to their customers. So we already know that they have an invested interest in making things faster. And again, that's music to my ears. And then we have the third thing that I think uh, bodes well for uh, evangelizing performance and the adoption of speed in the mobile space. And that's, we have all different kinds of users uh, work at, uh, using mobile. They're talking, certainly. They're texting. They're streaming. They're doing this from all different kinds of geographic locations, network conditions at all different ages. But they all have one thing in common. It's slow. So who here is really satisfied with the speed of their mobile experience? Yeah, me too. So this is really important. You know, we had this, it doesn't happen anymore, but I think we can all remember five years ago, maybe a little bit more, where, uh, you know, the manager of the group or the, uh, you know, VP of the company would get these complaints about the website being slow, and they would sit down at their desk on their fast computer with an amazingly fast LAN connection, and they would load the website, and they would say, it didn't take that long. I don't understand. Why are people complaining? And there was this lack of awareness of what the end user was really experiencing. It wasn't until that executive went home and ran it on their dial-up connection or DSL connection at home on the uh, home desktop that was maybe three, three years old that they really got an appreciation for what the uh, typical user was experiencing. We don't have that problem on mobile. All the executives, all the tech leads, uh, all the people in sales and marketing and product management have this phone and it's slow. Well, not this phone. This is the Google phone. They have this phone. And it's slow. <laughs> um, so there's a lot more uh, uh, empathy about the speed of mobile and how painful it is and how important it is to make it faster. Okay, so the first part of the talk, we all know that speed matters, it's better for the company, it's a win, 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 and we know that everyone has a slow experience and there's a lot of business opportunity for uh, making sites faster, and uh, we know that the big players care about performance. So why is it so bad? I think one big reason is this. Developers, when they're working on mobile, have zero visibility. That is up until the last few months. So what I want to talk about now in the third part of the talk are some of the tools that have emerged over the last few months and over the last week to uh, provide developers some visibility into uh, what they're building for the mobile experience. So the first of these is uh, something called MobyTest from a company out of Ottawa, Blaze.io. And um, it's built on top, how many people here know web page test? That's pretty good, yeah. If, uh, so I'll have some takeaways at the end, but the number one takeaway is go to webpagetest.org. It's an amazing tool. Well, okay, but this is a mobile conference. So go to blaze.io slash mobile. Um, and what you can do, even if you don't have a phone available to you, you can go here and you can pick a phone and you could type in a URL like twitter.com or wikipedia.org and it will run it. And it will run it on, um, they have iPhones and Androids connected to this service. You you can pick, they have uh, different versions of them. You can pick the one you want. You can load the website. It'll get you a waterfall chart and uh, also record screenshots of the page loading and run that as a video. So you can see not only how fast it is, but how does it render? Because sometimes those two things aren't necessarily correlated that well. Excuse me. So that's a really good tool to uh, try out. Now. It's a great tool, but one of the limitations is um, it's running in Ottawa, so you know that your users might not be centered in Ottawa, Canada. Um, it's running on Wi-Fi, so I have no visibility into 3G, and it's running on. You have to give it a URL. So if you have an internal website or uh, an internal beta that hasn't been released yet, you can't run it on there. Or if you have to do authentication, like if you want to look at Twitter logged in, you can't do that. So it's a good tool for public. 
URLs, but if you want to do more digging, um, you really have to uh, use something else. So here's another tool that I use a lot um, from a couple guys, Brian and Lebo at Google, called PCAP Perf, a really terrible name. Um, and uh, basically what you do is on your laptop you start a Wi-Fi hotspot, you connect to that hotspot with your mobile device, and then on the laptop you start something like Wireshark or TCP dump, and you start surfing on your phone, right? So now the beauty of that is if I need to log in, I can log in. If it's something that's on the corporate intranet, I can get to it, right? So it solves some of those constraints that we had with Blaze.io. Um, and then, what, and then when you're done, you stop TCP dump, and it generates a PCAP file, which is a uh, packet capture format, which is too low level. Like for me, there's two things I always want to see, I start with when I'm looking at the speed of a website, is a waterfall chart with those horizontal bars and a page speed or Y slow report about the performance of the website. So this PCAP file is too low level. There's no way to get that from a PCAP file directly, but what these guys found was this open source software called PCAP to HAR. HAR uh, is an industry standard format I helped create a few years ago. It's in IE9, Chrome, um, and um, once you get something into HAR format, there's a lot of tools that will take that format and produce the things that, for me, are most helpful. Um, so you can go to this website, PCAP Perf on AppSpot, load up your PCAP file that you just captured on your laptop, and then it will generate a waterfall chart so this uh, looks very similar to, what, Firebug? Yeah? So this is written by Hansa, um, and he's the guy who wrote NetPanel in Firebug and was one of the guys that helped create the HAR format, the HAR specification. So he basically just lifted that JavaScript code out of Firebug, built a standalone uh, JavaScript file that encapsulated the code, and made it accept a HAR file. A HAR file is just JSON, and so it's really easy to generate this waterfall chart from a HAR file that that you've captured. And then also the uh, PageSpeed guys at Google created something called HAR to PageSpeed that will take a HAR file and generate a PageSpeed report. So someone was just asking me about this yesterday. Uh, how, how on the phone can I get a waterfall chart and a PageSpeed report? This is how you do it, right? You capture this packet capture file and then you run, convert it to HAR and run it through these tools. So it is a little clunky. There are a lot of steps and manually intensive and someone will fix that. We'll get, you know, some scripting to pull, pull it all together. But it's something that you can do now. So this is, this is a, you know, again, it lets me look at sites where I have to authenticate, sites that are inside my firewall, um, but still I'm on Wi-Fi. So what about 3G? So um, I wanted to, you know, what, why do we want to look at 3G? Well, one thing is what's the speed? The speed on 3G is going to be very different. But the other thing is transcoding. So these carriers will do things. I was in Sydney when I discovered uh, maybe one of the worst offenses, uh, Optus down there would um, actually take the HTML document, they would scan it, they re remove all the image source URLs, download those images to their web server, resample them to a very low quality, and in in inject new image source URLs pointing to their server. So you're downloading the page, and I'm noticing like YouTube and um, you know Wikipedia are all loading their servers off of a Optus. Uh, server. And it's like, oh, okay, so they've transcoded the HTML. But even worse, they put this JavaScript file that they owned in the page so that if the user double tapped on the image, the high res version would get downloaded. But this HTML was injected in the page in a painful way for me uh, that blocked all other rendering and downloads in the page. And the quality of the JavaScript was really bad. Like, they had a loop that went through. Um, get elements by tag name star, and on every iteration through the loop, they would get the length of that HTML collection, which we all know is really painful. So they're taking pages that, that people have optimized, like YouTube and Wikipedia, and they're ejecting this really bad, low quality uh, web stuff in it. And so I wanted to have visibility to that, and, um, and so that requires uh, getting access to the page when served over a 3G network, through a carrier network. So I created this thing called JDrop, um, and the tag name is, it's Jason in the cloud. Um, so one thing I discovered about uh, 
uh, smartphones is um, you can run bookmarklets in them. So I collected, I built and collected a bunch of bookmarklets into this thing called the Mobile Perf bookmarklet. You can get it off my website. And so, like, I threw Firebug Lite in there and uh, CSSS, and then I wrote a bunch of other ones um, to do various things. So. Um, this is really nice. So you can install this one kind of Uber bookmarklet. Uh, it runs on every uh, mobile device that I've tried. And you can get this information, like a list of the page resources. Um, you can actually get document source out of the page on your mobile device. Um, what I want to show is this one called Dom Monster, built by Thomas Fuchs of, of Scriptaculous. So here I ran it on Google Search, and he has this great, some stats and some great advice about um, the page, but this is actually just the summary information. There's about five times this much information that it's outputting, but that would be really painful to consume on this little device. Same thing with the other bookmarklets I wrote. Like, can you imagine looking at document source on this little phone? So the idea is, the mantra is to gather locally, analyze globally. I want to gather the data on the actual device, but then I want to analyze it on my laptop or desktop where I have more screen real estate. So that's where JDrop comes in. So it's a very simple API. Uh, the ones that I wrote, uh, the ones that Thomas wrote, a couple other people wrote, they just add this link to save to JDrop. They wrap the data in a JSON structure, and what you do on your phone is you log into JDrop, then you run the bookmarklets, you save the data, and then you sit down at your desk and you log into JDrop, and all the data that you just collected on the phone is now there on the desktop desktop, and you can view it there. So here's the Dom Monster results, and you can see he's got a lot of good valuable information that I wouldn't want to have to sift through on this tiny 480 by 320 screen. So JDrop lets us gather this data and analyze it um, more easily when we sit at our desk. So I wanted to do some case studies around that. Um, so I looked at uh, the Alexa Top 10. So first I looked at Google Search, and what I did was I ran these bookmarklets on a desktop version of the website, iPad version, and iPhone version. And I gathered various statistics, the number of HTTP requests, the size of the HTML document, and how many DOM elements are in the page. So let's look at Google Search. So we see something that's you know maybe kind of expected. Um, the number of HTTP requests is higher on desktop, drops a for iPad, much lower on iPhone. So that makes, that makes sense. You know, when we're on a carrier network, we want to do less HTTP traffic. But the thing that was interesting to me was when we look at the size of the HTML document, there was not a commensurate drop in the size of the HTML document. So I was kind of curious about that. If the HTTP request went down, it's probably a simpler page. How come the HTML didn't get smaller as well? So I looked at this. My first guess was uh, inline images, data URIs. And sure enough, if you look at the desktop and iPad version, there's only 10 data images, inline images in the page. If you look at the iPhone version, there's 68 inline images in the page. So here's something where Google Search, one of the most successful websites in the world, is deploying this best practice for mobile that people really haven't talked about too much, inlining images, and they're doing it to a very high degree. So um, that was one takeaway that I got. Um, and the way that I you know, how, how could I have discovered that on this phone with the tools that existed before? It would have been very difficult to do that. But here I could run DocSource, the bookmarklet, actually get the document source from the iPhone, and then load it up on JDrop and just search for data colon image. And I can find, if you do this, um, you can find 68 occurrences of this string. By the way, by default, all the data that you load up to JDrop is private, but you can make it public. So all the ones that I'm showing here, you can actually go there right now, click on public, and you'll see all of this data, and you'll be able to examine it yourself. So then I looked at Bing, and I found another really interesting takeaway that I haven't heard a lot of people talk about either. I noticed for them that... Um, that the HTML document size actually doubled on the iPhone. It was twice as big as it was on desktop and three or four times bigger than it was on the iPad. So this was really surprising to me. And again, I figured, oh, well, they're probably doing inline images. But when I looked at the document source, I couldn't find any inline images. So I had to reverse engineer the code a little bit. And what I found was um, they were using local storage. So again, I had no tools. 
um, to look at local storage on the mobile device. So I real, wrote a new bookmark called Storager, and what it does is it lists all of the local storage keys for the website that you're currently looking at, wraps it in JSON so you can save it to JDrop and go up there and examine it. And if we look at this, we see that what they're doing is they're storing strings of CSS and JavaScript. They're br breaking their CSS and JavaScript that you get on the desktop. They're breaking that down into uh, smaller strings and saving those into local storage. So what happens is the first time you go to Bing, you have no cookies, and it says, OK, well, I'm going to have to download all of the CSS and JavaScript. It's about a 200-page HTML document. But once that page lands on your phone, it actually takes all these strings, about 20 or 30 strings, of JavaScript and CSS and writes them into local storage and sets a cookie that says this user now has local storage full. So the next time you do a search, the Bing server sees that cookie and says, oh, well, they already have all the CSS and JavaScript in local storage. I don't have to send that down. So now this HTML document that was 200K is now only about 30K. So they're using local storage for that. And I thought that was very cool. I hadn't heard people talk about that. And I was kind of disappointed that Google search wasn't doing it. So I went back to check. And I was pleasantly surprised to find that actually Google was doing it. And in fact, they were doing it even more. They had the, I just discovered this yesterday, working with someone from Google. We figured this out. Inside of here, they also have the inline images um, in this local storage. So they're saving their JavaScript, CSS, and inline images all in local local storage, setting this cookie thing. Slightly different format, but same idea. Um, so those are the tools that uh, I typically talk about. Um, there were some others um, that have come out recently uh, that I just wanted to highlight. Uh, one is um, Winery, although you know that's the um, uh, suggested pronunciation. Those of us with high school uh, mindsets call it Wiener. Um, it's always good for a laugh. And uh, so this is a remote debugger. So I think these, these tools that I talked about are really valuable. Um, but being able to do remote debugging, especially as part, so these other tools maybe are a little um, better or easier to use for discovering and gathering data. But if you're really doing development and you need to tweak JavaScript or CSS, these remote uh, debuggers are really valuable, and it's the way we're going in the future. So Winery has actually been out for, uh, I forget how long, but I think quite a while. Um, and it works. It's very cool, and it's getting more focus, especially from the Nitobi guys. Um, Dave Johnson was at my office a couple months ago, and we were working on this. He's going to come to a demo of it at Velocity next month. And then this week, we saw two announcements. Dragonfly 1.0 came out, and we were playing with this last night, and I kind of ran it through a couple uh, stress tests, and it did well. Um, so Opera Dragonfly you can use for Opera Mobile. And then we saw the announcement, I think, two days ago about um, WebKit remote debugging. Uh, so you can look at that as well. OK, so I'm kind of wrapping up. I wanted to get to this last uh, project that I've been working on, the HTTP archive. So I actually built this about six months ago and then kind of went silent with it and uh, gathered data for a few months and then announced it, I think, at the end of March. And uh, so what is it? Um, so uh, let me just. Uh, highlight some, some text here from the mission statement. So uh, how many people here know the Internet Archive and the Wayback Machine, Brewster Kale? Yeah, so that's very powerful. I think it's something that, you know, back in 1996 when he started it, people might have thought, oh, this seems kind of weird. What's the value of this? But I think certainly today we would agree that the web is one of the most important tech technological discoveries of our time. And Brewster's insight that creating a record, an archive of that, was going to be important for society to be able to look back on uh, how the internet grew and, and how the content that was in there grew. And so he created the Internet Archive, which um, collects and archives the digitized content uh, that's out there on the web. Um, but one thing, he, the, the, the things that I want to look at is how does the amount of JavaScript grow over time or the adoption of PNG image formats? And the Internet Archive doesn't capture that information. So I've been wanting to do that for about four years. And I finally realized with the open source tools that were out there, uh, 
um, it would be pretty easy to build. So actually, I built it in one weekend. And what it does is it records the information about how this digitized content is constructed and served. So um, it's a permanent repository. You can use the data to see trends in uh, adoption of technologies and, and use of different technologies. And another thing that's valuable is it provides a common, available data set for scientists to use when they're doing studies. They want to see, again, how these technologies are being adopted. What I found was a lot of people were trying to analyze websites and gather data from websites, and they were doing that in ways that were not consistent. Um, so now we have a common starting point for those studies to, um, to uh, get their data from. So here's an example of a trend chart. It's actually kind of scary. So right now, the HTTP archive, it's built on top of webpagetest.org. Um, about every two weeks, I give it a list of the top 17 or 18,000 websites in the world, and I get all this data back. I save all the HTTP headers, so I can get this trending data. Um, and what we see is over the last five or six months, the uh, total transfer size of these top 17,000 sites has gone up about 7 or 8 percent. So that's not, 7 or 8 percent isn't huge, but 7 or 8 percent in six months is pretty big. Like if we keep up with that pace, we're going to get, um, have put more and more demands on uh, the network infrastructure that's out there. Um, so that's kind of interesting. You can drill down and you know, slice and dice the data in all different ways. If you look here, you see the main issue is images. The number of images on a page has stayed about the same, but the size of those images has grown by about 14%. Um, so there's interesting trends you can look at. It's fun just to go through this stuff, and, and I encourage you to do it, htbarchive.org. Uh, Here's another um, uh, set of charts that I just blogged about yesterday. Um, you can look at the top 100 websites versus the top 1,000, and look at this. For the top 100, we see the total transfer size is 400K. For the top 1,000, it's 674K. So we're not even in the tail. Like, I wouldn't call, you know, top 1,000 tail, but we can see there's a tremendous change in the things that I care about for performance. So I think we've had, uh, like I mentioned before, I think we've had fairly good adoption, good traction of these performance best practices in these top 100 websites, but as we drop off from there, we see that the stats that are relevant to performance get worse and worse and worse. Another stat I blogged about is expires headers, where about, um, 75% uh, of the resources on the top 100 pages are cacheable, but that drops to about 50% for the top 1,000. Um, so uh, if you know, you're not in the top 100, you might want to look and see how you compare and if there's some places where you could tighten things up. Um, and we have aggregate stats, but we also have stats on individual websites. So for any individual website, you can go in and see trends about size and amount of JavaScript. And we also record a video and screenshots of the site loading. So you can also see you know, how progressive rendering is working in the page. Um, so it's an open source project. All of the data is downloadable right now. They're just MySQL dumps for every run. Uh, so it's a very open project, and you know I announced it about a month ago, and already there are five or six people contributing code. Um, so it's going really well. So now I want to get to the uh, secret announcement that um, I was talking about, and you know with what I was just mentioning, and it's probably pretty obvious. And several people came up to me yesterday, and they were asking about it. Um, so what I what I want to announce today is the HTTP archive for mobile. So, <laughs> woo! so I started about uh, I started this about two weeks ago. I was coming here, and I really feel like every conference I go to, I have to have something big to announce or software to release. And it was about two weeks ago, and I was thinking, okay, like, okay, so what can I announce at? Uh, mobilism. And I'd been talking about this, you know, it, to me it was pretty obvious that um, the HTTP archive is gathering data using web page tests uh, running on top of IE8, and that the data that it was gathering would be very different if we gathered that data using a mobile device. And so about two weeks ago, I was thinking, like, what can I pull together in time for mobilism? And I contacted uh, the CTO over at Blaze, and I said, is there a way that we could run, web, run URLs through your 
Mirror framework, just like I do with web page tests, and get back these HAR files. Because once we have a HAR file, all the rest is really easy and already built into the HTTP Archive software. And he said, yeah, let's give it a shot. So um, here, here you can just go, uh, there's the website, mobile.htparchive.org. Uh, and so we see some interesting comparisons. So if we look at the top 100, right now we're only running 100 URLs, so we'll grow that, but uh, we need to buy some more devices. So if we just compare the top 100 desktop versus mobile, it's about 400K uh, total transfer on desktop, 270K on mobile, which is still pretty heavy, but luckily it's less, so people are aware that they should be loading less data into their mobile pages. Um, and this is kind of interesting. Everything is the smaller, so the uh, amount of images, amount of JavaScript, amount of uh, CSS, of course the amount of Flash, is smaller on mobile devices, except for HTML documents are actually bigger. So this actually bodes well for performance. My guess is some of the things I talked about before, inlining images, inlining CSS and JavaScript when possible, is getting some adoption, and that's why we're seeing HTML documents bigger on mobile devices. Uh, a couple other interesting takeaways. This one doesn't bode so well. So 54% uh, of the top 100 websites on desktop have at least one redirect. That's 68% on mobile, which maybe isn't too surprising. If you go to www.facebook or Taobao or Bing, you get redirected to MDOT for all of those. So there's a lot of, in the top 100, a lot of those that happen. The sad thing is redirects on a mobile phone are very painful, much more painful than if you're on a desktop. So uh, websites need to figure out a way to avoid that uh, extra redirect. Um, and here's another one. If we look at the uh, uh, websites that have the most JavaScript, New York Times shows up in both the top five for both desktop and mobile. And it's really, so that's bad to begin with. So if you're, you know, the New York Times, you know, you should look at this stuff and wonder why you're on this uh, kind of page of shame. But what's really interesting is they have 230K of JavaScript on desktop, 320K on mobile. So they actually have 100 more K of JavaScript for their mobile page, um, which certainly, you know, doesn't bode well for, for speed. So that's the HTTP Archive mobile, uh, you know, uh, play with it, make some comments, send me some email, um, and over the next couple of months, we're definitely going to add more devices, add more URLs, um, and gather more data. And then also, as we see these trends, right now there's only a week's worth of data. I got the idea two weeks ago, so um, there's only a week's worth of data. As we get you know several months' worth of data and we start seeing trends and how uh, web development is moving on mobile, I am sure that will uh, reveal some other interesting insights. Okay, so that's about it. Um, what are the takeaways? Uh, speed matters. I hope we all agree with that. Um, faster mobile, I think there's a lot of opportunity here. There's a lot of business opportunity. Um, uh, the players in the space are already using uh, speed as a competitive differentiator, and everyone who's on mobile has this shared pain of a slow experience. So I think we're going to, uh, it'll be pretty easy to evangelize web perf uh, performance in the mobile space. Um, luckily, we have tools that are giving us visibility as developers into what we're building on mobile. Um, so there's uh, Blaze.io, PCAP Perf, JDrop, and uh, please go to the HTTP Archive mobile, play with it, and send me any comments that you have. And then I have one last little teaser before I go. So Velocity is in a month, uh, and it's just, I mean, it's phenomenal. I got a bunch of emails last night about registrations are through the roof. Uh, you know, one of the highest registration weeks O'Reilly's ever had. Um, and we've got, you know, we closed four more sponsors yesterday. So um, this focus on performance is really taking off. I'm very excited to be a part of that. And uh, we launched Velocity China last December. We'll be doing that again this December. And for about two years, people have been asking me about doing um, Velocity EU. And so we don't have anything official to announce yet, but next week, uh, Gina Blaber, the head of conferences at O'Reilly, is flying uh, to Europe to check out venues for Velocity EU probably later this year. So if you pay attention to my blog or follow me on Twitter, uh, hopefully in a month or so I'll have something to say about that. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Oh, 
I forgot to remove the auth. Okay, as soon as I get off the stage, I'll wait till I'm done with questions and then uh, I'll remove, there's a uh, auth protection on the website I forgot to remove this morning for the HP Archive mobile. So um, don't play with it yet. Wait 10 minutes after I'm done. Okay, are there any questions? I hope there are. Yes. Right here. I can repeat it too if you don't get a mic. Okay, hello. Uh, so first thing I'm thinking, uh, were you able to investigate you know, some issues like you did on desktop before, uh, like the number of requests, and which you know, number of connections user, uh, browsers are opening at the same time, uh, also how many resources are downloaded at the same time. So the stuff you know, we've been seeing for the past years uh, you've been researching on, on desktop. Are you going to look into that as well? And some other issues like you know, scripts after style sheets blocking, you know, all this stuff. What was the last other issue you mentioned? You said some other issues. Uh, yeah, the issues uh, with, for example, uh, I remember some, some we weird quirks with uh, style sheets placed after JavaScript oh, blocking. Yeah. Under. So this kind of you know, weird quirks which uh, you don't expect, but they happen. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's what I live on, is finding these um, kind of quirky, unexpected behaviors. Um, so yeah, you know, I've been looking at that for the last few months, and there's um, you know, obviously a lot of um, new territory there. I mean, it's pretty easy to find stuff. I was sitting here yesterday, and um, I, just, I, I was running one of these um, uh, you know, remote debuggers that could uh, track traffic, and I was telling Brian about this last night. I went to the top 10 websites, you know, Google, MSN, Bing, Amazon, and then I stopped for one minute, and I went to them again. So the first time I went to those 10 websites, there were 150 HTTP requests that were cacheable for a day or more, 150. I went to those websites again. So you would think, like, you know, it's been one minute, Right? Those things should be in the cache. Out of those 150 resources, 110 of them were re-requested, even though they had cache dates of a year or 10 years. So it's really hard to do um, you know, black and white cache analysis. The, you know, it's very onerous to you know, uh, run it over and over again and clear the cache. But just empirically, I think we all have that experience where we go to a page, go to a different page, and go back, and it has to reload. So um, you know, that's, there's all these observations to be made. Uh, Android only opens four connections total across all domain names. So if you're doing domain sharding on mobile, um, that's actually a bad best practice for mobile. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of insights out there, and you know, I'll be uh, researching those and blogging about those, definitely. Oh, and there you go. Thank you very much. Any other questions? <laughs> Are you aware of any tools that can be used to do this practice of, in, of um, local storing uh, CSS uh, and, you, and JavaScript? You, you mean uh, like tools for doing it in your yeah. website? Yeah. If we wanted to do that on our site, could we go on the net and find some tools? Uh, no, I don't know of any tools um, for storing uh, you know, those things in local storage. But you know, it's probably about 20 lines of code. I guess the hard part would be um, you know, detect, you know, the hardest part might be uh, feature detection to make sure that you have local storage available to you. Um, but you know, on um, um, smartphones, at least, you know, I think it's on every smartphone that's out there. And you know, but it's pretty easy. You could look at my bookmarklet. You know, the bookmarklet is just a JavaScript file. I don't even—I uh, hate to say it—I don't even minify it. So you could just look at my bookmarklet storager and see what it does um, to query. And it—it uh, it doesn't just display what's in local storage. It actually lets you edit and clear what's in local storage. So you'll see all of the, uh, you know, CRUD actions that you can do to local storage there. Yeah, it would be pretty easy to do. And and I think and that, that's that's uh, actually something I forgot to mention in the talk is. 
you know, about a year ago when I started talking about wanting to work on mobile, people said, well, why? You know, you, you know there's these lists, 28 rules that you have. Don't they all just apply to mobile? And I said, well, I don't know. My guess is about half of them apply. About a quarter of them don't really make much difference, so you shouldn't waste your time. And about a quarter of them, like domain sharding, are, are actually bad for mobile performance. And then there's a whole set of best practices that are important for mobile that we don't even uh, talk about. So in this talk, right here, you know, when I first started really deep diving into mobile, I found these two best practices, uh, inline images and local storage. And it's really interesting that those first two best practices that, being, uh, that I see being used out there are not covered by YSlow or PageSpeed. You know, the two preeminent performance analysis tools out there don't have these two best practices for mobile. So I really think there's a lot of uh, room to f make discoveries of, of new best practices for mobile. Uh, yes. Uh, what is the big advantage of uh, using local storage for CSS and JavaScript as opposed to using uh, traditional HTTP cache headers? Well, like I just mentioned, um, on mobile, uh, you know, even after one minute, those resources weren't in the cache anymore. And so the cache on, on mobile devices, I don't have the code, and as, as I mentioned, it's really hard to do a, a very scientific, rigorous study of the exact behavior from a black box perspective. Um, but you know, just you know, anecdotally there, I loaded a page, I went to nine other pages, and when I went back to that page, its resources weren't in the cache anymore one minute later. So if you put it in local storage, it will be there uh, much longer. I don't know, and you know, that would be another interesting thing to look at, is my guess is the length of time. I think on Firefox, uh, there's a five megabyte limit um, and a five per website and a 500 megabyte total limit. I don't know what they are for these phones. I haven't seen anyone talk about that. And again, it would be pretty painful to do a rigorous test to try to figure that out from a black box perspective. But certainly, the, there's more room for data and the data is gonna last longer than if you just rely on HTTP caching headers for mobile phones. Um. I have one question regarding the uh, local storage. Um, what are the reasons to use JavaScript to store CSS and JavaScript in local storage um, uh, and not use uh, an um, HTTP manifest, HTML manifest file? Okay, so you know, one question was about just storing using HTTP headers and typical resources, you know, response bodies. Um, so this question is, why not use uh, app cache? Well, I don't know about other people. I think the app cache API is really painful to develop with, right? Um, as a developer, you know, you've got to rev the manifest file, and I always forget, you know, um, I always forget to do one thing, and so like it takes me if I want to actually change a resource and get some new JavaScript or CSS down, I've got to like try three things. And the other thing is the way it works. Um, you know, you have to load the site and then load it again to actually get your changes downloaded, even if it sees the change in the manifest file. So I think the API, I think the intention is good. You know, I love having an offline experience, but I think the API is kind of painful. I'm actually surprised no one has built some uh, wrappers around app cache to make it a little easier. Um, but certainly you could use app cache. That would be another alternative. Um, to me, just this whole idea that I've got new code for you, but you're not going to see it the next time you go to my website. You'll see it two times after you go to my website. I have a hard time with that. Hi. Uh, do you know of any plans to uh, measure the performance of these local store kind of calls or device API calls and, and, and put them in the HAR file format as well? Yeah, so the HAR file format is just JSON, so it's, it's intentionally built to be very extensible. For example, it can store the body of all the responses, but that can make the file really big, so if you don't store the body, everything should work. It's not like these HAR viewers will fail if the response body isn't there. Um, so it's very flexible. 
Um, so you can add anything. If you're creating HAR files, you can add anything you want to the format. So if you had a tool to do that, you could add those. Uh, if you wanted it to be part of the spec, there's a mailing list, and you could su suggest that those be part of the spec. But um, right now, there's no discussion of, of measuring these low-level APIs and putting that into the HAR format. I know, I think you mentioned local storage specifically. I know on Chrome and Firefox, there has been some, you know, so then we, we look at how local storage is being used on mobile devices. How come we're not doing that on desktop? We saw with Google, um, it's only doing the local storage stuff, Google and Bing, on mobile. Um, so I think Firefox and Chrome both have had some uh, analyses done where local storage is really slow for some reason. Um, so it would be good for you know someone, maybe me or someone else, to do some experiments to measure the behavior of local storage in these other APIs. Um, but putting those into HAR, there's no specific discussion of doing that right now. Yeah. Um, you were talking about nobody um, did a wrapper for, for app cache. Um, my company has actually open sourced a, a build system which uh, uh, traverses the graph of every asset uh, linked to an, uh, an, a website or a web application. That's what we're using it for. Uh, you can then apply transformations to this graph, uh, which might be um, what uh, manifest files. Uh, we're doing that right now. We're doing uh, automatic uh, spriting of images, um, modifying the CSS, stuff like that. Um, it's open source. It's on GitHub. Um, Asset Graph, it's called. Uh, it's not version 1, and it's not documented yet. But we're running it, and it works. Cool. Um, maybe if you want to tweet and you know put my name in there, then people could find a URL. OK. Maybe okay. one more, last one. Yeah, okay. last one. Yeah. Uh, so I was thinking, do you have any you know insights into some size constraints when it comes to caching? So you know there is this uh, rule: combine assets on desktop. But I'm thinking if there are some constraints on mobile which might prevent the caching. If you, for example, combine too many files into one, so you know mobile browsers might have some constraints. Do you have some? knowledge about this, maybe? Yeah, I do. Um, so I was at Yahoo when we did that first study that found with iPhone 1 that anything over 15K or 25K wasn't cached. Um, and then, you know, about a year ago, someone at Yahoo, I forget who it is now, um, did a, a similar study, and they concluded again that like uh, anything above 25k was not cached on the iPhone. And it turned out that you know I knew that wasn't true, and it, and so I connected with the person, and it turned out they had a flawed experiment. So I actually um, you know pointed out the deficiencies, and uh, we we both reran experiments independently and co-blogged about it. Um, so in fact, you can get uh, you know a two megabyte JavaScript file cached on the iPhone. Um, so, as far as, you know, if you care about iPhone 1 users, you might want to keep things under 15K, but um, for all the smartphones that are out there now, I don't think there's any specific file size limit that you have to worry about. Um, and certainly on mobile, it's better to have fewer HTTP requests. Uh, as I mentioned, like on Android, it's, you know, people say, oh, well, you know, I can get more parallel downloads. Android will only open four connections max. So it would really actually be optimal to have one JavaScript connection, one CSS connection, uh, one for images, one for HTML or JSON. Um, so combining requests is, is even more important on mobile. Okay, um, so you know, I'll be here the rest of today and tonight, and I'm out of books, but uh, come by and ask questions. Love to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you.